Okay, we're picking up, we're starting today, Hamlet, which we're going to be on for two weeks or so. I think about, I think I've got uh, roughly two days for each act. Uh, it's probably going to take a little bit more than that. Um, Hamlet first performed 1600. It survives in not only the first folio publication of 1623, but it survives in earlier publications. And I think the earliest one is about 1600, 1601. Um, it survives in more than one version. That is, between its first performance in 1600 um, and its early publications and the version that is in the first folio in 1623, or I should say from 1600 to before Shakespeare's death in 1660, it appears that Shakespeare revised the play. Some of the speeches are changed dramatically. Pieces are added, pieces are dropped. Uh, Shakespeare does the exact same thing, by the way, with King Lear. King Lear exists in multiple versions. Some of those with both Hamlet and Lear might not be by Shakespeare's hand. They might be by others. We're just not sure. I'm going to talk about one of the big differences in readings, you know, individual words, when we get to Act 1, Scene 2, in Hamlet's first soliloquy, the very first line, has a word in it that your text has the earlier version of the word, and the first folio presents probably the later version of the word. Okay? Um, Hamlet's a revenge tragedy, which I'll talk about in just a moment, Shakespeare, as with all of his plays, he doesn't come up with this on his, on his own. There's an old story in Danish about a prince named Amblin. Okay, that's Hamlet. Uh, it's thought that the story itself probably, if I remember correctly, probably goes back to about the 8th century. And this, this character, Amblin, may have been historical. According to a Danish uh, chronicler named Saxo Grammaticus. I don't think he's mentioned in your textbook. You don't need, need to know that. He gives us this story, and it's essentially the basic story. The prince who discovers his father was murdered and his uncle murdered him, took the throne, etc. Um, between this story, Saxo Grammaticus publishes um, his version in the Middle Ages. I want to say around 1400, that might be a little late. Uh, in Shakespeare's version in 1600, it's been speculated that there is an, what's called an Ur Hamlet. Ur just means lost source, Hamlet, okay? Prior to Shakespeare writing his version. And this lost source Hamlet is in English, or it's thought, was in English, again, if there was such a thing, it's lost. We don't have it. Um, but it's not that Shakespeare probably didn't get the basics for the play just from or straight from this. We could all we could go up to 1994, where there's a much more modern version of, of Hamlet, but it's not called the Hamlet. It's a Disney movie, 1994, The Lion King. We've got Scar, Mufasa, Simba, so Claudius. Hamlet Sr., Simba, Hamlet Jr. It's the same play, essentially, all right? Um, revenge tragedies. Revenge tragedies were kind of the rage in the late 1580s, early 1590s. By the time Shakespeare writes Hamlet, it's gone out of vogue. I mean, it's, it's no longer a real hip or popular um, genre. And it's, you know, Shakespeare isn't just writing a revenge tragedy. Your book mentions the Spanish, um, Spanish tragedy by Thomas Kidd. That fits the, the old Roman model of a revenge tragedy perfectly. Thomas Kidd does, right? In which you have a family member who is told by a ghost of a deceased family member to avenge slash revenge the ghost's death, okay? And so the working out of the play, the whole 
movement of the play is getting that revenge, right? It usually involves madness or feigned madness on the part of one or two characters, often the person who must do the revenge, okay, because I mean, think about it, uh, your dead father comes to you and says, I was murdered, avenge my death, that kind of kind of make you go a little bonkers. Um, and obviously death, lots of it. By the time we get to the end of Hamlet, well, just in act five of Hamlet, we are going to end up at the final closing scene of the play. We're going to end up with four bodies on stage. Okay. This kind of tragedy is not like the ancient Greek. Remember when we were talking about Oedipus and Antigone? In ancient Greek society, it was not appropriate to see any kind of death or violence on the stage. All of that always occurred off the stage. By the time you get to Roman tragedy, nah, blood and gore is fine. By the time you get to Shakespeare, it's even more, I mean, compare us to bloody or bloody or bloody, right? So you end up with you know five bodies. By the time you get to the end of Hamlet, total number of deaths, if you include Hamlet Sr., just go through them quickly. Nine, nine named characters. Pretty sure that's it. Uh, that's a lot, okay? And almost, all but two of those we actually see. Okay, we see those, take all but three of those, because we don't see Hamlet Senior's death. Um, okay, we can go from there. So, the play opens. You got your list of your dramatis personae. Um, one thing to notice kind of there, look at the names. All but really two of them maybe four, but they're all Roman. Claudius, it's not a Germanic name. Hamlet is Germanic, okay? Gertrude probably is, and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, uh, more Germanic than Roman, but Polonius, Horatio, Laertes, Voltamon, Cornelius, Marcellus, Bernardo, Francisco, Reynaldo, Fort, those are all Roman names, which is kind of a, an oddity, a bit of an anachronism you know, in terms of you know, where it's located and stuff. Okay? So act one. So we're told the scene is Denmark. That is, the world of the play is Denmark. Okay? Act one is at Elsinore. Elsinore is not the name of the castle. I've had students before on quizzes, you know, where is the play located? And they immediately get on Google. Okay, don't do that, by the way. They immediately get on Google, and Google tells them, you know, Hamlet is located in Elsinore, which is modern day X, Y, Copenhagen or something like that. And they go and they, you know, no. Elsinore is a place, it's not the name of the castle, right? They are specifically located on a platform in front of the castle, okay? Castle is not named. Two sentinels come in, Bernardo and Francisco. Bernardo begins to play with a question. Who's there? Why? Okay, do Bernardo and Francisco walk in side by side? No. One walks in one door, the other one walks in the other door. Okay. Bernardo, who's there? Nay, answer me, stand and unfold yourself. So Bernardo, who's there? Francisco answers, but he doesn't say, it's me, Francisco. He says, no, you, <laughs> you tell me who you are. So why do we begin with that question? Who's there? Again, we were told with the stage directions at before, what are they? 
What's meant by sentinel? You're standing guard. You're standing watch. Okay? Each one enters, and it's not like they walk out the door and Bernardo says, who's there as he walks out? They come out, one kind of over here, one kind of over here. You know, you can often, with, if it's a live production, often there will be fog, so they've got the fog machines going. Can't really see her clearly. It's nighttime, we're going to be told. Who's there implies what? Francisco, excuse me, Bernardo, Bernardo hears something, okay? Who's there implies a couple of things. One, he's alert. He's taking the job seriously. Two, he's alone, which we already know. And so he's, his feelers are out. Francisco, nay, answer me. Stand and unfold yourself. That is, reveal yourself. Long live the king. And, and it's almost like it's a password. Either a password or a greeting. I didn't know that Bloss said that. Bernardo, yes. You come most carefully upon your hour. In other words, man, you're cutting it close. You should have clocked in earlier. And Bernardo says, it just struck 12. Get thee to bed. I'm on time. Francisco, for this relief, that is for relieving me at my set time, thanks, bitter cold, I'm sick. He's not sick at heart because of the cold. Sick at heart implies what? I'm not freezing to the bones. He is cold. Sick at heart implies, I got the willies. <laughs> Something's going on. I'm, I sense something. Okay? Bernardo, the yeah, quiet guard. In other words, what's got you worried? Is, is everything... Quiet, not a mouse stirring. Shakespeare gave Clemens, Samuel Clemens that phrase, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. There it is, not a mouse stirring. Okay, Bernardo, well, good night. If you do meet Horatio or Marcellus, the rivals on my watch, bid them make haste. If you see these other two, tell them to hurry. Why? Because Bernardo doesn't want to be there alone. We don't know why yet, but we're going to be told shortly. And enter Horatio Marcellus. So Francisco hears something. He doesn't see them. And he asks again, who is there? So twice now, who's there? The question is important for the theme, the meaning of the play. Who is there is, is kind of going to reverberate. Why? One of the issues we see in this play is this, spying, or W-A-T-C-H, watching, observing, okay, is going to resonate all throughout the play. What does it imply? You're looking where? Out there, not in here. Okay. Horatio, friends to this ground. Marcellus, in liegemen to the Dane. That is, we are sworn, you know, deputized soldiers, so to speak, to the king. Okay, so Francisco says, cool, sleep well. Um, Bernardo, da, 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 da. Francisco gets ready to leave. And Bernardo asks, is Horatio there? Horatio, a piece of him. Welcome, Horatio. Welcome, good Marcellus, Bernardo says. And Marcellus asks, has this thing appeared again tonight? Now, we don't know what this thing is, but it's probably why Bernardo told Francisco, if you see Horatio and Marcellus, Tell them to speed it up. Okay? I have seen nothing. Horatio says, Marcella says, Horatio says, tis but our fantasy, and will not let belief take hold of him touching this dread sight, dreaded sight, 
twice seen of us. So what has he just told us about Horatio and whatever this thing is? He will not let belief take hold of him. He won't believe it till what? Till he sees it. And notice how Marcellus says that. He will not let belief take hold of him, touching this dreaded sight, twice seen by us. We've seen it twice now. Horatio hasn't seen it. Therefore, I have entreated him along with us to watch the minutes of this night, that if again this apparition come, he may approve our eyes and speak to it. He may approve. Your gloss says corroborate. Literally prove. He will agree with us. Okay? Now, go back for just a second to the first line of that speech by Marcellus. Horatio says, tis but our fantasy. Think, I think. This plays only about two years after Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay. Theseus has that long speech about fantasy. Fantasy, imagination, the lover, the madman, the poet are all compact, you know, of imagination. And the imagination does what? It gives shape to airy nothing. Okay. He says it's our fantasy, it's just our imagination. Marcellus says, Horatio says, the thing we say we see isn't real. Horatio, it will not appear. Sit down. Let's tell you about it. Okay? So they sit down, and Horatio says, let me, let me hear from Bernardo. Why? Because he's already heard about it from Marcellus. So he wants to get another perspective. Again, think of a Midsummer Night's Dream. What does, get the name right, Hippolyta say? After Horatio, after um, Theseus gives a speech about imagination. Yeah, but these four lovers all saw the exact same thing. They all had the exact same dream. Okay, so Bernardo says, last night of all, that is, last night was the last time we seen it. When yon same star that's westward from the pole hath made its course to illumine that part of heaven where now it burns, meaning at this exact same time. Marcellus and myself, the bell then beating one, and the ghost comes in. Peace, break the out, look where it comes again. Bernardo, in the same figure like the fiend that's dead. That is, whatever it is, it looks like dead Hamlet Sr. Marcellus, to Horatio. Thou art a scholar, speak to it, Horatio. Now your gloss tells you exorcisms are performed in Latin, which Horatio, as an educated man, would be able to speak. Personally, I think that gloss is utterly ridiculous. Because nothing is said about exorcisms in the body of the text. Yes, a scholar, and all that's meant by scholar is student. Okay. Horatio is a student at Wittenberg University, just like Hamlet is. All right? So, students did know Latin. Why? Because everything in the universities was conducted in Latin. So, thou art a scholar, speak to it, Horatio. All that means is, you know Latin, and you know more than we do. Marcellus and Bernardo are soldiers. He didn't have to have a GED or college degree to become a soldier. Horatio, uh, excuse me, Bernardo, looks or not like the king? Mark it, Horatio. Doesn't it look like the king? That's a simile, right? Saying it's not the king, but it looks like the king. Mark it. Notice, pay attention, Horatio. Horatio, most like. 
And then later on, he's going to qualify that most like. It harrows me with fear and wonder. And you've got a, another stupid gloss for harrows. Lacerates the feelings. What, what does it mean to lacerate the feelings? What is a laceration? It's a cut. How do you cut the feelings? What does it really mean? It scares the hell out of them. That's what it means. It probably is a biblical illusion. Or, another way of putting that, an allusion to early Christian doctrine. Okay? Shakespeare's day, common belief among Christians, that when Christ was in the tomb, when the body was in the tomb, the spirit, Christ's spirit, descended into Hades. Hades isn't hell. Hades is just the place of the dead. Okay? Descended into Hades. This was part of the apostles slash Constantinopolitan creed. I can never say that word. Descended into Hades to bring back the souls of the righteous dead, beginning with Adam. All the way up to like John the Baptist. Okay? Take him to heaven. It's called the harrowing of hell. It's the removing the souls from the dead, or from Hades. It harrows, he says, me with fear and wonder. It's like it's going to take my soul away. It scared the hell out of him, in other words. Horatio, uh, Bernardo, it would be spoke to. The gloss says, a ghost could not speak until spoken to. Okay? Could be. It could just mean somebody needs to speak to it. So, Horatio, what art thou that usurps this time of night, together with that fair and warlike form in which the majesty of very Denmark did sometimes march? By heaven I charge thee, speak! <coughs> Okay, there's a lot in those four lines. Notice the first word of the question. What? Not who. What art thou? He doesn't say, who are you? Okay. Why? doesn't know that this is the ghost of Henry Caesar. It could be something else. So what are you that what? Usurps this time of night. What does it mean to usurp? It's to take possession of, to take control of, wrongly, illegally. Like what? Well, let's use a Lion King. Like what Scar does with, you know, Mufasa's kingship. He kills his brother, has him killed. Why? So he can become king. He has usurped that position. It's not his rightful position. Whose is it? Within the film, it belongs to Simba. Why? It's the law of primogenitor. Eldest son becomes ruler after that. Okay? So, what art thou that usurps this time of night? But how can you illegally take control of a time of night? What's it really mean? You don't belong here. Why not? Assume for the moment it is a ghost. Where do ghosts belong? What are ghosts? Assume for the moment ghosts are real. What are they? The souls of the dead, right? The spirit of the dead person. Where is that supposed to be when the person is dead? If you're a Christian, one of two places, Catholic, maybe purgatory, okay? Uh, if you're a Stoic, gone. <laughs> there is no soul anymore. You just die and your whatever makes up your soul dissipates into nothingness. That's it. So, it usurps the time of night because it shouldn't be here. All right? Together with that, it, so it's usurping with that fair and warlike form 
in which the majesty of Barry Denmark did sometimes march. It's not just usurping this time of night. It's usurping what? It's taking the image of the dead king. It's usurped that. To use the, part, the modern, you know, woke term, it's appropriated it. Wrongly is being implied. Why do you look like the dead king? By heaven, I charge thee, speak. Why does he say, by heaven, I charge thee? I'm, ask, I'm asking that, actually, for a very specific reason. According to most scholars, readers of Shakespeare, Horatio is a Stoic. Stoic is a Roman belief system, Roman philosophical belief system, that essentially said, this life here is all there is. There's nothing afterwards. There's nothing before. There's no pre-existence of the soul, like Pythagoras thought. Greek philosopher, mathematician, came up with the Pythagorean theorem. Okay? And there's nothing afterwards. You die, that's it. So the key purpose of life is to find the happy medium here so that you don't suffer great sorrows and you don't enjoy great highs. The purpose of life is to just kind of move along on, a, on an even keel, to use a sailing metaphor, all right? So when, if that's true about Horatio, that he's a stoic, when he says, by heaven I charge thee, speak, what's he doing? Because the Stoic doesn't believe in heaven. It's not by the heavens, the stars, the planets, all that kind of stuff. It's by heaven I charge, by God. He's using heaven, uh, can't think of the term, so I'm gonna kind of create one, metonymously, okay? Heaven referring to the place where God dwells, like Washington says, Washington doesn't speak. Washington is a place. It's where the White House is. Or the White House, you know, said. The White House doesn't speak. Joe Biden speaks, okay? By heaven, I charge thee, speak. If he is a stoic, what will be the efficacy of that charge? None. Jesus, go back to the Gospels, at one point, sent his disciples out in groups of twos, okay? Not the 12, his massive followers, 70 followers, 70 disciples. And they came back, and some said, you know, there were these people who were possessed that we couldn't cast the demons out of. And he calls, Jesus calls his followers, faithless and perverse generation, and he says, these kind only come out by much prayer and faith. No, at least prayer and fasting, all right? You got to believe <laughs> in order to have that kind of power, so to speak, over demons and spirits and such. By heaven, I charge thee speak. Notice what the ghost does. It's offended. What does that mean? How do, how do we, audience, know it's offended? It's a verbal stage direction. That tells us, that tells the actors, the character, excuse me, the actor portraying the ghost has got to do something. Has got to respond to Horatio's charge. Usually what you see is the ghost turns its back and just kind of walks away on Horatio. I think it would be entirely appropriate with this kind of modern, I'll modernize it a little bit. Have the ghost throw a bird at Horatio. Like, who the hell do you think you are charging me? Okay? And then Bernardo, see, it stalks away. That's telling us what the ghost has done. That causes Marcellus to say, it's offended. Horatio, stay, speak, speak. I charge thee, speak. And the ghost leaves. Bernardo, how now, Horatio? What do you say now, Horatio? You tremble and look pale. Would he tremble and look pale at a mere fantasy? 
something of his imagination? Is not this something more than fantasy? Remember the end of Theseus' speech about the power of the imagination? How else can a bush look like a bear? What do you think? Before my God. See, that kind of implies he's not a stoic. Real Stoics didn't believe in God. Before my God, I might not disbelieve without the sensible and true about you of mine own eyes. Go back for just a brief moment to Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find. What's the problem that the misfit reveals to us? Like the last page. Jesus thrown everything off balance. How? He raised the dead. And what's the problem for the misfit? He wasn't there to see it. Because if he had seen it, he says what? Then I'd have known. Okay? Who else? A week after the resurrection, Jesus appears to ten of the disciples, apostles. Judas is dead because he killed himself. One of them isn't present. Thomas. The next day, Thomas is with the other ten. The other ten tell him, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas says, unless I put my finger in his hand and my hand in his side, I will not believe. And he gets a tap on the shoulder. Thomas turns around. And Jesus does this. He says, Put your finger in my hand, put your hand in my side, and see that it is I. Anybody know Thomas's words? My Lord and my God. And Jesus replies and says, Blessed are you because you have seen and believed, but more blessed are those who haven't. Okay? He says, I might not disbelieve unless I'd seen it with my own eyes. Marcellus. Is it not like the king? Notice, again, a simile. Doesn't this look like the king? Not the king, but like the king. Marcellus is saying it's not the king, but it sure looks like him. Horatio does what? He corrects him. Is it not like the king? As thou art to thyself. Well, how is Marcellus to himself? How are you to yourself? You are you. What's Horatio saying? It's not like the king. It is the king. Which then gives you know, rise to all kinds of complications. Such was the very armor he had on when he, the ambitious Norway, defeated. And he finishes that little speech, to strange. Marcellus, this is the third time we've seen him. Thus twice before and jump right at this dread hour, dead hour, okay? Horatio, I think this bodes some eruption to the state. That is, the you know what's about to hit the fan. This is a portent, this is an omen. So Marcellus says, why are we keeping watch? See, Marcellus Francisco Bernardo, to use a, a kind of a crude phrase, they're just dumb grunts. They're just dumb soldiers told to stand watch. They're not told why. They're just told to keep an eye out. So Horatio explains why. He gives us some of the background. He gives us some of the exposition which adds to the complication of the plot. And he talks about <clears throat> young Fortinbras of Norway. Young Fortinbras is the prince of Norway, okay? His father was named Fortinbras Senior. So, Hamlet Junior, Hamlet Senior, Fortinbras Junior, current prince of Norway, Fortinbras Sr., dead king of Norway. So who's the current king? 
We're never told specifically, but the implication is it's Fortinbras uncle, which presents its own kind of problem, all right? So Horatio goes on and explains, young Fortinbras is doing what? He's proving himself. He's testing himself. He wants to regain the lands his father lost, Fortinbras Sr., to Hamlet Sr. And that's why we're at war, or that's why we are at watch. Bernardo, top of the next page. I think you're right. I think it'd be no other, but even so. He says, and that's why the king, excuse me, that's why the ghost looked armed. Horatio, a mote, line 112, a mote it is to trouble the mind's eye. There's probably a biblical illusion there. Christ talks about judging others, and he says, take the beam out of your own eye before you remove the speck from your brother's eye. Speck, like a little speck of dust. Look at yourself first, see the problem you have, but Horatio says this is a moat, a speck of dust to do what? To trouble the mind's eye. What does a speck of dust in the mind make the mind do? It focuses on that. A speck of dust in your real eye makes you do what? It makes you do this because it bothers you, it annoys you until you remove it. The speck of dust in the mind's eye stays there until you also remove that or figure out what the problem or the cause really is. So, it's a moat to trouble the mind's eye, and what does he do? He then leans back to, reaches back to ancient history, Julius Caesar. Shakespeare had just, a couple of years previously, written Julius Caesar, okay? We're coming up on the date that Horatio is alluding to. Friday is March 15th, the Ides of March. According to historical sources, Caesar received word from a soothsayer and his wife, okay? Beware the Ides of March. Caesar didn't listen to that. Shakespeare really plays that up in his play. And he went and met with the senators, Brutus, Cassius, and the others, and they stabbed him to death in the Roman Forum. Okay? That's what Horatio's whole speech is going on about. And the ghost comes back in, kind of right in the middle of it. But soft, behold, where it comes again. I'll cross it, though it bless me. The gloss says, meet face, thus bringing down the evil influence on the person who crosses it. Okay. Why is it an evil influence? Again, where are ghosts supposed to be? With their bodies, okay? Popular belief, ghosts don't ever mean well to there's, there's always something nefarious. So, Horatio speaks, gives um, four conditions to the ghost. Gives it four opportunities, we could say. That if the ghost does something, Horatio can do something. So, stay illusion. What does he mean by illusion? Notice you don't have any gloss to that. What's he mean by it? Stay vision, stay phantasm, stay thing that isn't real. He wouldn't be talking to it if it were any of those things. Ill, bad, wrong. Illusion, sight. Stay bad, sight. Bad vision, mal vision. Again, it's usurping, remember. You shouldn't be here. 
If thou hast any sound or use of voice, speak. If you can talk, speak. Okay? We're told the ghost spreads its arms. Your gloss says the ghost, or perhaps Horatio. Okay, this is in the text. That it spread his arms. It's, it's very weird. Why does it spread his arms? Why doesn't it say it spread its arms? Or does it mean the ghost comes up to Horatio and stretches his arms out? If there be any good thing to be done that may do thee, that may to thee do ease and grace to me, speak to me. Okay? Any good thing to be done. If there's any good deed, any good work. I'm using very specific terms. To be done that will ease whatever your situation is, your pain, your sorrow, etc. Or bring grace to me, speak. Okay? Why would he say that? Folk belief. Sometimes ghosts return to their place, that is, where they lived, because they have unfinished business. Filmed several years ago, uh, Ricky Gervais and several other people, he plays a dentist. He's a prick. I mean, just a horrible person. And he comes to realize he's dead. And he's got to kind of fix the problems he created, right? Well, if there's something I can do that will bring ease to you, that will relieve your pain, give you consolation or solace, he says, or grace to me. Grace is a theological concept. This is the first, pretty sure it's the first, time in the play that we have a theological kind of issue brought up. By the time we finish this play, you're going to be so sick of hearing about all of these theological concepts because this play is probably the most religious of Shakespeare's plays because he's wrestling. He may be wrestling. It's one way, one way of putting this is that Shakespeare is uh, dialoguing Calvinism, Protestantism, and Catholicism. In his day... That was the big controversy, even in 1600, all right? This big rupture in society, which is right, which is true? Is it the Catholic belief, belief system or is it the Protestant belief system? And we're gonna see both brought into play in this play, okay? So, if I can do something that brings ease to you and that will, or will bring grace to me, grace means from God. Why? Catholic belief, if you do good works, that draws the grace of God down upon you. Okay? Speak. If thou art privy to thy country's fate, why thy country's? Notice what Horatio is now totally assuming or believing. This is the dead king. It's not just an appearance. It's not an illusion. Thy countries, the dead king's countries, which happily for knowing may avoid, speak. How could the dead king know about something in the future for the country? That if they could do something, they could avoid it. Well, first of all, we should go back to Oedipus, right? Because <laughs> that implies what about the future? It can somehow be known. If it can somehow be known, then it's fate. If it's fate, you can't change it. All right? What's the other thing? When, when do ghosts exist? What is their time frame? Outside of time. 
It's only when we're alive that we are in time. When you're dead, you go to, I'm not talking heaven or hell, if the soul continues, eternity, outside time, okay? So if that's the case, then if the ghost is outside of time, how does it see all of time? Now, that is it sees yesterday, <laughs> today, tomorrow, in a moment. It's all one. Or, last option, if thou hast afforded in thy life extorted treasure in the womb of earth, for which they say, you spirits oft walk in death, speak. Again, this is a folk belief that the dead sometimes come back because they have hoarded wealth during their lifetime that stays hoarded and buried when they die. And the idea is wealth exists for a purpose. What is it? To distribute. We could talk about a bunch of old English poetry that essentially is you have treasure for one purpose, to help others who don't have it. It's not he who dies with the biggest bank account, you know, wins. It's he who dies with the depleted bank account, so to speak, wins. So, if you have that hoarded wealth, notice, and it is extorted treasure, you cheated others out of it, okay? Speak. He doesn't finish. He doesn't give what he will do, but it's implied. Tell me where it is, and I'll dig it up, and I'll give it away. Okay? Stop it, Marcellus. Why? It's another verbal stage direction. It's like the ghost has started going towards Marcellus. The implication is probably the door for the tiring house is over here, and Marcellus is between it and the door. Marcellus, uh, shall I strike it with my partisan? A long spear, it also has a blade. It's what? It's a ghost. They're going to talk later. Like we can really hurt it. Okay? It leaves. And Marcellus said, I couldn't have stopped it anyways. Okay? We find out it leaves when the cock crew, and Horatio says, and when it crew, it started up like a guilty thing, and he says, you know, I have heard folk belief again, what? That the rooster is the trumpet to the morning, and when the rooster announces the break of day, what happens to the dead that are roaming the world, the ghosts? They go off to where they should be during the day. That is, they go back to their bodies. Whether those bodies are in the ocean, in the fire, in the air, or in the ground. Okay? Marcellus gives another possible indication. And he gives us a time of year for the play. Some say that ever against that season comes wherein our Savior's birth is celebrated, Christmas. The bird of dawning, that is the rooster, sings all night long. Why? Well, you follow that upon what Horatio just said. And if the rooster is crowing, then the dead stay dead. <laughs> the souls of the dead stay with their bodies. Why? Because the coming of Christ represents the defeat of the powers of the air and such. Therefore, no spirit dare stir abroad. The nights are wholesome, then no planet strike. That is, there is no astrological influence of the stars and planets, etc. So, Horatio says, you know, I partly believe that. In other words, you know, some of that's kind of fairy tale stuff, right? So, Horatio says, we need to tell him what it is. And get him to watch with us. Scene two. Now, all of scene one happens roughly when? 
12 a.m. to about 1 o'clock in the morning. Scene two is not happening at the same time. It's probably the next morning. So scene one, you're out there, you're on the battlements, it's cold, it's dark. Here, you now have a room of state, lavishly decorated. And then come the king and queen and all their followers. And Claudius gets a long speech, which we're not going to read all of. Though yet of Hamlet our dear brother's death, the memory be green, and that it thus be fitted to bear our hearts in grief and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe. Yet so far hath discretion fought with nature that we with wisest sorrow think on him, together with remembrance of ourselves. So, yet the memory of the death of our brother is green. What's he telling us? Hamlet Sr. hasn't been dead long. How long has he been dead? Your introduction said two months. Maybe, maybe not. There's going to be a line in the play that says twice two months. Two months? Four months? Possibly earlier? Or less than that? Okay, so our brother's dead not very long. And he says, the whole country did what? Contracted in one brow of woe. Now, our nation is so divided, if Joe Biden died today or was assassinated, God forbid, the whole country wouldn't be contracted in a brow of woe. There'd be those out there going, yeah, you know, same thing, okay? Go back 50 years. No, go back 60 years. JFK. A lot of people did not like JFK. I mean, when JFK won in 1960, it was razor thin. And left and right will tell you, he won by fraud. Chicago threw it for him, okay? But the whole country mourned. Or when MLK was assassinated, the whole country mourned. Yeah, except for the KKK and you know, whatever. Bobby Kennedy, same thing, right? The country is together in this mourning. He says, but, Discretion fought with nature, and with remembrance we thought of ourselves. That is, I thought when my brother died, it made me think of me and what? Thinking that my brother died made me think I too will die. Okay? So what does he do? Because he's thinking he too will die. Therefore, thinking of my brother's death and that I too will die, our sometime sister, now our queen. What does that mean? I married my dead brother's wife. What is that an example of? It's illegal in almost all the states in the United States. Why? Because the United States still has incest laws. The imperial joint tris, <laughs> we've joined to this warlike state. Have we, as twere with the defeated joy, that is, the joy has been sorrowed a little bit, with an auspicious and a dropping eye, tears, with mirth and funeral, dirge and marriage, an equal scale, weighing delight and dole done what? Taken to wife to kind of overcome the sorrow of my dead brother, I married his widow, okay? It's very appropriate, you know, Colonel Biden with his dead brother's wife. They didn't get married, but they did have a relationship. And then he goes one step further. He says, nor have we herein barred your better wisdoms, that is, as people he's speaking to, you are our counselors and advisors. We got your counsel for all our thanks. Why? Because they have freely gone with this affair along. What has he just done? Can't blame me for marrying her. 
because you all agreed to it. You all suggested it as the invitation, okay? So, he then goes on and explains why they're kind of armed for war. And he sends Cornelius and Wolfman off as ambassadors to Norway. Then he addresses Laertes, Polonius' son. Polonius is his right-hand man. He's the next most powerful man in Denmark. Laertes says, I'm going back to the university. Do you have your father's blessing? Yes, I do. Farewell. Then he addresses Hamlet. And he says to Hamlet, line 64, but now my cousin Hamlet and my son. And I just noticed it's 10.05. We'll stop there. We'll pick up there on Wednesday. Um, the, there's a quiz up for like the last half of Midsummer Night's Dream. It's real easy, 10 points. I think there's extra credit. It's due Wednesday night. Originally I had it due tonight. It's due Wednesday night. Um, you have 10 minutes. You shouldn't have any problem with it. All right, we'll pick up here on Wednesday.